Hello. Today I'd like to talk to you about Franz Josef Haydn, an Austrian composer. He's also one of my favorite composers because of his sense of humor and his outlook on life. Franz Josef Haydn is called the father of the symphony orchestra. He's also the father of the string quartet. He was beloved by his orchestra members who nicknamed him Papa, and he was beloved by the people of Vienna. Now, Haydn was born March 31st, 1732, in a very tiny town in Austria. His father, Matthias Haydn, was the local wagon maker or wheelwright. His mother, Maria, had been a cook in one of the lesser royal households until her marriage. Haydn remembered his family as being very musical. His father had taught himself to play the harp, and everyone sang. When he was about six, he was, however, given to choir master Johann Frank, who was situated in Hamburg, which is a slightly bigger town. Now, Frank was paid to take Haydn and to educate him in harpsichord, violin, and to have him sing in the church choir. Now, he was also a very distant relative of Haydn's mother. However, Mrs. Frank, Frau Frank, did not really like her husband bringing home what she considered strays, despite the fact that they were being paid to raise them. As a result, Haydn was always hungry. His clothing was tattered and ragged and dirty. And the choir master would beat him if he did not do his lessons well. He also explained to Yosef that it was very expensive to feed children. So when Haydn was not singing in the church choir or doing lessons, he was in the streets singing for pennies. And of course, children who are singing for money in the streets, if they are clean and look healthy, don't make as much as those who have been beaten, look very hungry, and are ragged. In 1739, George von Reuter, who was the choir master of a cathedral in Vienna, was traveling through Heinsberg and heard Haydn sing. He approached choir master Frank, and money exchanged hands again. But this time, money was given to Frank to allow choir master Reuter to take him to Vienna. In Vienna, Josef was given lessons in Latin and violin and keyboard but he did not receive music theory or composition. Again, he was not treated well because there were a whole group of children that this choir master was attempting to raise and to uh, educate. Haydn told his bi biographer, I was motivated to sing well in hopes of gaining invitations to perform before aristocratic audiences because the singers there are usually served refreshments. He was heard by the Empress Maria Theresa, who, when he was a young child, said he had the voice of an angel. But then, when he was 17 and his voice changed, she referred to him as sounding like a crow, cawing. So his voice has changed. He's seven years, 17 years old. He's dismissed from the choir after receiving a caning for misbehavior, and then sent into the streets with only the clothes on his back. At this time, he's kind of hunts for other musicians. He finds musicians that he can stay with, and he also musicians that he can learn composition from, and he begins with them to be a street performer. At that time, he also starts taking his first commissions and eventually has enough money to get himself his own little apartment and to buy a used clavier, which was a keyboard instrument. He's giving lessons also at the same time. He also, at this time, is approached by a librettist who wants to him to write an opera. So he does. He writes his first opera. It's a smashing success until the censors close it down for obscenity. In 1757, the Kapellmeister for Count Morin gives him his first time full-time job. He now is, oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. He is the Kapellmeister for Count Morin, and it's his first full-time job. It, his salary includes free room and board and lodging. What a wonderful thing for him. He is still giving clavier lessons, and through that, he meets the Keller family. The Keller family has two daughters, and Yosef falls in love with Teresa. Unfortunately, he's told, Teresa is destined for the church. She's been promised, and she's going to become a nun. But they tell him he can marry their older daughter, Maria Anna. 
So in 1760, Haydn marries Maria Anna Keller. Maria Anna Keller and he had a very sad marriage. She did not have a sense of humor, and Haydn did. She thought Haydn was ugly. She'd been forced into marrying him. And Haydn kind of agreed in that he decided he too was ugly. He was short for, his, for the age. He also had legs that were too short for his torso. He also had pock marks on his face from smallpox and a polyp inside his nose, which made his nose get quite large sometimes. Also, the worst thing of all was Maria Anna did not care for music. Haydn told one of his friends he would come home and find his manuscripts been torn into little strips so that Anna could curl her hair, or that Maria Anna would have lined a baking dish with one or started fires with them. However, they could not divorce. They were Catholic, and of course, Haydn was working for the Catholic Church. Plus, he had signed a contract, and with every of his employers, he also had to sign a contract, and they usually included a morals clause, nothing to embarrass their employer. So, in 1761, he is hired by P Prince Paul Anton Esterhazy. They get along very well. But he, of course, he has to leave Vienna because he has to follow the Esterhazy court. Paul Anton dies quickly after that. But in 1762, Prince Nicholas I becomes his employer. And he works for the Esterhazys for the next 30 years. This is the time that he standardized the symphony orchestra and becomes known as Papa Haydn. He also was a very good businessman. And he was good at negotiating with his publishers. I was watching a little thing online where the person referred to him as being greedy. I think it was more of he remembered being penniless and didn't want to do that again. However, he also was generous with his friends and with his symphony orchestra. And one of the pieces he wrote for the Esterhazys was called the Farewell Symphony because Franz Josef had asked his employer for a raise, not for himself, but for the orchestra members. And when it was refused, he wrote this symphony. In the last movement, one by one, the orchestra members closed up their instrument cases, took their music, and left the stage. So at the end, all that was left was Haydn turning and bowing to the prince. The prince thought it was hilarious, and they got their raise. In 1790, Prince Nicholas I dies, and his son, Anton, comes to be the prince. He does not particularly care for music, and in a cost-cutting measure, he dismisses all the court musicians except for Haydn, whose wages he cuts. So Haydn has nothing to do, so he asks the permission of the prince to allow him to travel. The prince agrees, and in 1790, he goes to London, where he is just amazed at how much they love him. Everyone in London, including the critics, thinks he is great. And at that time, he wrote his London symphonies, the most famous one of which is called the Surprise Symphony, which again demonstrates Haydn's sense of humor. The second movement of it starts with a very simple melody, da, 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 like that. When it comes back, Instead of doing it very soft, it gets even softer, and then suddenly crash, everything in the orchestra, every member, blurts out a very loud chord. The women in the audience supposedly screamed, and the men in the audience started laughing. It became a smash success. In 1791, he returned to Vienna, and he worked with Beethoven there and became his mentor. He also gave free music lessons to Mozart's two sons, Mozart having already died by this time. In 1793, he's asked back to London, where they're promising him a job if he'll stay. So he goes back to London and stays there until 1795, when Prince Anton dies, and his successor, Nicholas II, reestablishes his orchestra and reminds Franz Josef that he is still under contract and please come back. So he does. At this time, Josef had been very impressed by hearing God Save the King, and decided that they needed something like that in Austria. So he wrote what's called the Emperor's Hymn, which became Austria's national anthem until 1918. However, in 1930, 
someone named Adolf Hitler took over it and it became Deutschland über alles. I don't believe Haydn would have liked that. Then in 1991, it again was used as a national anthem for the United Germany and is called the Song of Germany. In 1803, Josef felt he was physically unable to keep up his duties as, as Kapellmeister, and he asked the prince to please let him out of his contract. Nicholas II said, you no longer have to work, but you will always be my Kapellmeister, and he continued his income for life. In 1803, he made his last public appearance as a conductor because he could no longer stand for long periods. In 1808, March 27th, he was carried in a sedan chair to a performance of his Oratory of the Creation, which was conducted by Antonio Salieri. Trumpets, drum rolls, and a standing ovation greeted him. He was embraced by Beethoven and many of his other students. In May of 1809, Napoleon attacked Vienna and bombarded Haydn's neighborhood. They put Haydn's house under guard, supposedly for his protection, but the people of Vienna viewed that as putting Haydn under house arrest. In May 26, 1809, Franz Josef sits at his clavier for the last time and plays his emperor's hymn. Later that evening, he collapsed. May 31st, 1809, he died at 12.40 a.m., aged 77, and his last words were, children, be comforted, for I am well. Due to the continuing war, it was not possible to have a large funeral, as the Esterhazys had planned. A memorial service was performed with Mozart's Requiem being played. The cortege that went to the cemetery included French military and the citizens of Vienna. He was interned in the Hans Strom Cemetery until 1820 when Prince Nicholas decided to move his, his body to the new church he had built in Eisenstadt. They opened the casket and, surprise, Haydn no longer had a head, just a wig. Quickly, they decided that his head had been taken by a phrenologist. These were people who studied the bumps on your head. It turns out on June 4th, 1809, which is five days after Haydn died, a grave digger named Jacob Dermoth was paid to dig up his coffin and remove his head. It was then taken to Karl Rosenbaum, who was a friend of Haydn's, and Johann Peter, who was a phrenologist. Hot, hot weather had caused great decomposition, causing Rosenbaum and Peter to both vomit when they received the skull for dissection. They boiled the skull and examined it and decided, yes, the bump on his head that is about music was quite large. Then the skull was kept in a special box in Rosenbaum's home. Prince Esterhazy finds out about this and demands return of the skull. He sends his agents over, and they are given an old man's skull in this ornate box. However, it's not Haydn's skull. Rosenbaum keeps the skull and continues to take it out to show people when they come over. In, after Rosenbaum's death, the skull passes through several hands before, in 1895, being given to the Society of the Friends of Music, who again, if they have special visitors, bring it out and show them to people. Prince Esterhazy by now knows about this. In 1932, the current princess, Prince Esterhazy built a huge marble tomb for Haydn in Eisenstadt in the new cathedral. And they were planning to move the body there with the new, with Haydn's head. They were going to reunite them. But then World War II happened. During many problems, finally in 1954, Haydn's skull was returned to Haydn. But what would they do with the other skull? I think Haydn would have found this very amusing, for he went from having one head to no head, and now he has two heads. So Haydn was a kind man. He was kind and nurtured other musicians. He overcame a very difficult childhood and personal difficulties in his life, but he never lost his sense of humor or his faith. Thank you very much for joining me. Have a blessed day.